Welcome to the third lecture of module six. This lecture is on the factorization method. We're going to show you how we solve the simple harmonic oscillator. The factorization method comes from Schrodinger. In 1926, Schrodinger invented the differential equation that launched wave mechanics. But in 1940 to 1941, he developed a new technique called the factorization method. And that's the technique that we're going to be teaching you primarily in this class. Today, you're going to see how we apply the factorization method to the simple harmonic oscillator. This ends up being the simplest case for the Schrodinger factorization method. And this technique is taught in virtually every quantum mechanics course. However, it already shows a significant number of interesting aspects about the general case. And so we're going to elaborate and show you how that works for this particular example. So I hope you're ready, because here we go. So the simple harmonic oscillator contains two terms. It contains a kinetic energy, which is the p squared over 2m term. And it contains a potential energy, which is the 1 half m omega squared x squared term. Now, you might be used to seeing that potential energy as a 1 half k x squared or a 1 half kappa x squared. But we're going to write it in the form 1 half m omega squared x squared. And if you remember that the frequency associated with a harmonic oscillator is given by the square root of k over m, you can immediately see that m omega squared is just another way of writing k. But we're going to find that writing it in this form is just a bit more convenient for us. It will simplify and streamline some of the equations that we're working with even though it looks a little bit more complicated at the moment. So how do we do this? Well, we're factorizing. This looks like the sum of two squares. Now, if I had the difference of two squares, I could do the factorization just by taking alpha minus beta times alpha plus beta. But this is the sum of two squares. I can still make that work if I take alpha minus i beta times alpha plus i beta. But of course, we're working with operators. So we're going to define an operator A, looking carefully at taking square roots of each of the terms. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 2m times the p operator minus i m omega times the x operator. And then if I take the dagger of that, I'm going to just change the sign in front of that i from a minus to a plus. Now we're factorizing it, so we have to look at the product. So let's compute A dagger A. I just plug in the definitions of what A and A dagger are. The two 1 over square root of 2m factors give me a net 1 over 2m. And then I have the product of the two terms, p plus i m omega x hat. It has the plus sign because I took the dagger. And p minus i m omega x hat. Now we just expand this out. But we have to remember that these are operators. And so order matters. So we're going to carefully work that out. And you see what you get is in addition to the p squared plus the m squared omega squared x squared, which were the two terms that we wanted, we got this extra term in the middle, minus i m omega commutator of p with x hat. Let me go back to the previous slide and just verify for you. One of the terms will have a p multiplying an x in that order with a minus i, and the other one will have an x multiplying a p with a plus i. So when you put those together, you get this commutator. But we know what that commutator is. It's just minus i h bar. So we can substitute in what that commutator is, and we get a net of minus m omega times h bar. Now I'm going to just rearrange. I'm going to first bring the factor into the parentheses, and then I'm going to rearrange the terms, bringing the operator terms to the left. And now you should be able to recognize that that is the Hamiltonian. That was the term that I was trying to get. So let's replace that by the Hamiltonian. And I'm going to move the minus 1 half h bar omega to the left-hand side. And then I'm going to switch left-hand side with right-hand side. And we get this identity that h, the Hamiltonian, is equal to a dagger a plus 1 half h bar omega. And in essence, this is the starting point of any factorization method. What I have to do is I have to factorize the Hamiltonian so that it looks in the, like it is in this form with an a dagger a plus a number. And every time we do factorization, we're going to be putting Hamiltonians into this kind of a form. All right, let's summarize that. We'll put that at the top of the page. Now, 
you probably don't have a lot of experience working with Hamiltonians that have this form. So let's talk a little bit about it. That Hamiltonian has a positive semi-definite operator in it. And I want to carefully go through and explain to you what positive semi-definite means. What it means is the expectation value of that term, the A dagger A, is always non-negative. Non-negative means zero plus positive numbers. So how does that work? Well, we start out by looking at an expectation value. And now if you look carefully at this, you see that I have a vector, that's the A acting on psi, and I have the bra of that vector, the Hermitian conjugate of that vector, psi A dagger. I wanna make sure you're clear. Vector and Hermitian conjugate of the vector. And I'm taking the inner product of a vector with the Hermitian conjugate of the vector. What is that? That's the norm squared, okay? And one property of the norm squared that we know is it's bigger than or equal to zero. And so anytime I have an operator that's in the form of an A dagger A, it's a positive semi-definite operator. So let's summarize that result. And now we want to find the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Well, when I'm in the ground state, when I take the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, I will find the smallest value that I could possibly have. Since the operator A dagger A is positive semi-definite, the smallest value it could possibly have would be zero. So if I can find a state in which that expectation value of that positive semi-definite operator is zero, then I found the ground state. How do I find that? it would correspond to a state that A acting on that state is equal to zero. We call that condition the subsidiary condition. And I wanna point out again for you that that is a condition where an operator has annihilated a state. I had mentioned earlier to you that every time we can find a situation where an operator annihilates a state, there's lots of good things to come. We can do lots of stuff with the situation where an operator annihilates a state. All right, let's explicitly verify that we actually get an eigenstate. Let's take the Hamiltonian, act it on zero. It becomes A dagger A plus one half H bar omega acting on the state zero. We're gonna then distribute that into an A dagger A acting on zero and a one half H bar omega acting on zero. Now we use the subsidiary condition. A acting on zero gives zero. So I can get rid of that term A dagger A acting on zero. It just disappears because it's zero. I'm left with one half h bar omega times zero, but you see that's a number times the original state. So that's an eigenvalue eigenvector relationship. And I can read off the energy eigenvalue from that. The ground state energy is one half h bar omega. Okay, we're done, we found the ground state. I hope you recognize that this is pretty simple stuff. It requires you just to be careful about how you order the operators when you're doing the algebra, but it's pretty simple, straightforward stuff, and it's very powerful. We worked pretty hard, and we used pretty sophisticated reasoning to get to this point, but we've already now solved for the ground state of the harmonic oscillator and found the ground state energy. All right, before we go any further, we have to change to the standard notation. What I just was describing for you was the way that Schrodinger described this. But it turns out in 1947, Dirac wrote the third edition of his quantum mechanics textbook, and he fiddled with the notation a bit. Actually, the final notation wasn't fully settled until even a bit later than, than this. But the final notation that everyone uses is completely and totally standard. Everyone uses it and sees it. And you need to know it in order to talk with anyone else. So even though we're going to be using the Schrodinger method and that Schrodinger notation for most of the problems that we solve, for simp simple harmonic oscillator, we cannot do that. We have to use the standard notation. But it's pretty simple. The only difference is that we're going to multiply those A and A dagger operators by a constant. And so I want to make sure that you learn and know the common notation and recognize that it just takes the Schrodinger lowering operator and multiplies it by i over the square root of h bar omega. And then we call that little a hat, and that's the Dirac form of the lowering operator. When I just multiply that out and collect my terms, I get square root of m omega over 2 h bar times x plus i 1 over the square root of 2 h bar m omega 
multiplying the momentum operator P. Now we want to evaluate the commutator. I want to look at the commutator of A with A dagger. When I look at the combination of these terms, it's the cross terms that I'm going to get because a commutator of X with X and P with P is equal to zero. When I look at the cross terms, I have, let's first look at the prefactors. I have a square root of m omega upstairs and a square root of m omega downstairs. Those will cancel. I have two square roots of 2h bar downstairs. Those will combine and give me a 1 over 2h bar. And then I have a net factor of i multiplied by a plus or minus sign. So if I start with the first term from the a, that will be the x term. And it will multiply the minus i p from the a dagger. And so I'll get minus i over 2h bar commutator of x with p. And then I'll get a plus i over 2h bar commutator of p with x when I look at the cross term that starts with a p from the a operator and then works with the x from the a dagger operator. Now, of course, commutator of x with p is i h bar. Commutator of p with x is minus i h bar. Each of those two terms are the same. They're each going to give me a 1 half. When I add them together, I get 1. So the commutator of a with a dagger is equal to 1. And when we go and we rewrite the Hamiltonian, we just substitute into that expression because we have that a a dagger plus the 1 half h bar omega. Using this new renormalization, it becomes an h bar omega times the combination of little a dagger, little a plus a half. And otherwise, everything else that we've done is essentially the same. Okay, we still have the same ground state. The subsidiary condition is the same. It's little a acting on zero will give zero and so forth. All right, now we're going to work out a very important relation that's going to help us find the higher energy states. It's called the intertwining relationship. And what we're going to do is we're going to have H acting on A dagger. And what we want to do is we want to bring the A dagger over to the left-hand side. We want to move it through the H and see what happens when we do that. So we first write out what H is and what the A dagger is. We bring the A dagger inside the parenthesis. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just factor that A dagger out on the left-hand side because I have an A dagger left over. And now I'm going to do the add zero trick. I'm going to add an A dagger A and subtract an A dagger A. The combination of the first two terms is going to give me a commutator, and the combination and the last term that's left over is going to give me the term that is going into the Hamiltonian. So I can evaluate that commutator. It's just equal to 1. I can now combine the terms and make it a 3 halves. And now I have to recognize what the Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian is the h bar omega times a dagger a plus a half. And so I'm left with a dagger on the left multiplying the Hamiltonian plus h bar omega. And so what we learn with this intertwining relationship is when I move an a dagger through an h, it increases the h or adds an h bar omega to the h, the Hamiltonian operator. All right, let's now take a look at how we construct the energy eigenstates. My claim is that the energy eigenstates are given by powers of a dagger acting on the ground state. There's a C that is a normalization constant. We're going to calculate that in detail in just a moment. But let's first evaluate and analyze and verify the eigenvalue eigenvector relationship. How do I do that? Well, I simply have to act H on the state and verify that it gives me a number times the state. So let's act H on the state from the left. And that is given by H acting on this product of A daggers. I'm now going to pull one of the A daggers out of that factor. Now look at what we have. We have an HA dagger. That's exactly what we can use the intertwining relation with. I'm going to move the A dagger to the left, and I'm left behind with an A dagger, H plus H bar omega. Now I'm going to do it again. I'm going to pull an A dagger out. Recognize I have an intertwining. Of course, I can immediately move the A dagger through the H bar omega term. But I also have an H Hamiltonian acting on an A dagger. And that I get rid of by using the intertwining relation. And it's going to shift the H bar, the uh, Hamiltonian H hat by H bar omega again. And so I'm going to get an H Hamiltonian plus 2 H bar omega. And I have two fewer powers on the right of the A dagger. Well, now I just repeat this N minus 2 more times. I'm going to pull, have all of my A dagger terms on the left now. And my Hamiltonian is shifted by N times H bar omega. But now I can evaluate this against the ground state. Remember, H acting on the ground state gives me 1 half H bar omega. So let's go ahead and do that. I get the 1 half H bar omega. Now I can combine these together. 
I get n plus a half times h bar omega, and you see that's a number sitting out in front of the eigenstate. So I just substitute in the definition of the eigenstate, and I've now verified that this is an eigenvalue, eigenvector relationship. So we have found the excited states, and the energy of those excited states is n plus a half times h bar omega. We're going to call that energy En, and just conclude that we have verified that these are indeed the eigenstates and the energy for each eigenstate is n plus a half times h bar omega. All right, we still have to work out that normalization factor. We can get the normalization factor from intertwining as well. Remember, this is what our state is with the normalization factor c. I have to calculate the norm or the overlap of the state with itself in order to determine the normalization factor. Of course, I get a mod c squared from this. And then I get the ground state and a hat to the n because the Hermitian conjugate of a dagger is an a operator, and then an a dagger to the n acting on the ground state. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pull out an a and an a dagger from the center of that. The a a dagger term can be rewritten as a dagger a plus the commutator of a with a dagger. So it's equal to a dagger a plus 1. Now, if I look and remember that the Hamiltonian was a dagger a plus one half multiplied by h bar omega, if I take the Hamiltonian, divide it by h bar omega, and add a half, I'm going to get a a dagger. So we're going to substitute in for a a dagger with the Hamiltonian divided by h bar omega plus a half. Now we just do intertwining. I have n minus one terms that I'm going through, so I'm going to shift the Hamiltonian by n minus 1 times h bar omega, but I'm dividing by h bar omega, so I'm going to get a shift of n minus 1, and that's going to give me, after I do the intertwining and move that all the way to the left, I'm going to be left with the Hamiltonian divided by h bar omega plus n minus a half acting on the ground state. Now I know what the Hamiltonian acting on the ground state is. It just gives me 1 half h bar omega. When I divide by the h bar omega, I'm left with a half. That cancels with the 1 half, and I'm left with just the number n. Now that's a number. I can take that all the way out to the left. And so I pull that out to the left. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to just repeat that. I'm going to pull out an a a dagger. I'm going to rewrite that in terms of the Hamiltonian. I'm going to use intertwining and bring it over to the left. I'm going to let it act on the ground state. And I'm going to pull out now a factor of n minus 1 after I've done that. And now I just repeat another n minus 2 times. And you see I'm going to get an n factorial. Okay, we're almost ready to get the normalization factor. I only have to remind myself that the ground state is a state vector, so that's a normalized state. So as long as we enforce the normalization on the ground state, then I can replace the overlap of the ground state with itself by 1, and now I'm left with the overlap of this state n with itself is n factorial times the absolute value of c squared. I'm going to take c to be a real number, and I'm going to make sure that that overlap of the state n with itself is equal to 1, and that simply tells me that the constant c is 1 over the square root of n factorial. And that's basically it now. We've finished the calculation. So let's summarize what it is that we've done. We showed that the Hamiltonian can be factorized. We're using this Dirac notation where we have a little a and a little a dagger. The little a is given by square root of m omega over 2 h bar times the x operator plus i 1 over the square root of 2 h bar m omega times the momentum operator. The a dagger simply changes the sign in front of the momentum operator. We carefully worked out that the commutator of this little a with little a dagger is equal to 1. And the Hamiltonian written in terms of these operators is h bar omega times little a dagger little a plus a half. We also found the eigenstates. We found the energy eigenfunctions were of the form state n or nth excited state is 1 over the square root of n factorial, a dagger raised to the nth power acting on the ground state. The ground state is denoted by the state where n is equal to 0. It satisfies the subsidiary condition. The a operator acting on the ground state is equal to 0. And we found that the energies for each of these states are given by En is equal to n plus a half times h bar omega. You can see that every time I look at the next highest energy eigenstate, the energy has increased by the same amount, by h bar omega. And I finally want to point out to you that you know, we did everything in this calculation algebraically. 
We used some logic in this as well. The logic was not completely trivial. You had to think a little bit about it. But it wasn't very difficult logic that we used. And in the end, the only thing that we used was the commutator of position with momentum. So that canonical commutation relation that we worked out was all that we needed to determine the energy eigenvalues and the energy eigenstates of the simple harmonic oscillator. You're going to find a little bit later in just a couple of lectures that we're going to actually be able to use that to also get us the wave function itself. Just like we use the commutation relation to get the position and momentum eigenstates of the position and momentum operators. And so this is really powerful stuff. And there are some simplifications that you come into with the simple harmonic oscillator that we're not going to see when we look at the general case. And we're going to tell you about how those complications enter as we need to. As you need to know that, we will tell you about it. But you'll still find that everything is coming from the commutator of position with momentum. And all of our reasoning and everything that we do is going to be done algebraically. So we can really learn a lot of stuff. Now, I'll just end with one final comment. You might be concerned, like, you know, uh, well, is that it? It's, it's kind of a letdown. It didn't seem like there's much to this. But we also need to be able to calculate matrix elements and probabilities and other things like that. And we can do all of those manipulating the operators as well. And it's going to take you some time to learn those skills. But once you've learned them, you're going to have very powerful techniques that you can use and solve many, many different kinds of problems. That's what you've got to look forward to. OK. We're now at the end of lecture three of module six.